O Lord, as we now come to your word. We pray, O Lord, that you would use your word to test us, to refine us, to grow us, to edify us, to convict us. We ask, O Lord, that you would use your word to accomplish your purposes in our lives. And we remember that your purpose, above all, with us, is to grow us in Christ's likeness. So please, O God, use your word to accomplish that purpose in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm 50. We're going to be in Psalm 50 today. Of course, normally uh, the other weeks of the month, we are in the book of John. But on the first Sunday of every month, we are in the Psalms. Uh, this month actually marks our, uh, the beginning of our fifth year in the Psalms, if you can believe that. Our fifth year in John as well. As you were listening to us sing, as you were considering the words for Psalm 50 that Isaac Watts uh, paraphrased the psalm with, you may have gotten the impression that this psalm is something of a wake-up call. This psalm has some very harsh things to say to us, and it does. It has everything to do with our worship and the fact that God cares how he is worshiped. There's, there's this idea that God just wants to be worshipped and that he doesn't care how, but he does care how. And this psalm is all about how God wants to be worshipped. You know, I have visited literally dozens of churches in my lifetime, whether it was a time in which, you know, my wife and I were looking for a new church before we came here almost 12 years ago. Um, or whether we were on vacation. When we're, whenever we're on vacation, we never take a Sunday off. We always go to worship someplace. So I have visited literally dozens and dozens of churches over the years. But there is one experience that I had in visiting a church that's, you know, to this day really stands out above any other experience that I ever had in visiting churches. We were still living in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I was going to seminary, and there was a new church that was one of the fastest growing churches in the country at the time. This was back in 2008. And because we were preparing to plant a church as well, uh, we were planning to move to Arkansas to plant a church, uh, we thought that we should check out this new church and see why it was growing so quickly. And I can honestly say that this church was unlike, and I'm using that term church very loosely here, I can honestly say that that church experience was unlike anything I've ever experienced before or since. The music, the worship music was very skilled. Uh, I'm sure that, the, that each member of the band was uh, on a professional level. Uh, it was all very well choreographed, very well orchestrated, but the music was very loud. And I don't say that because I'm old. I wasn't old back then. I'm old now. I wasn't old back then. The music was extremely loud. Uh, lasers were shooting all across the stage and the sanctuary. And as the, the band was playing, Christina and I looked around and we noticed that the only people apart from us who were actually participating in singing were the members of the band. Nobody else around us anywhere to be seen was singing. And I was just stunned. And, and to this day, I find myself asking the question, whenever I remember that experience, I, I find myself asking the question, did those people think that they were worshiping God by dancing or doing, you know, whatever they were doing while the band was playing? Because the whole environment was really set up more like a nightclub or a rock concert than like a church service. No wonder they were one of the fastest growing churches in America. See, there was a, a very dangerous theory for church growth back in that time, and from what I understand, it's actually still around today, which is basically centered on the idea that if you just have professional quality worship music, really, really good, really upbeat, up-tempo worship music, you can grow a church. And to that end, one of the things that large churches will do is hire unbelievers who are professionals, music professionals, to lead their worship. Now, assumed within this idea, which I should add, by the way, is an absolutely horrible idea to have unbelievers lead us in worship. It's 
horrible idea, an unbiblical idea, but assumed within this idea is the assumption that God doesn't care how he's worshipped, that he only cares that he's worshipped. But friends, nothing Nothing could be further from the truth. The stories of Nadab and Abihu, uh, the story of Uzzah, th- those stories teach us otherwise. They teach us that God does care how we approach Him. He does care how He's worshipped. When you take all of Scripture together and develop an understanding of worship, it leads us to understand that God not only doesn't accept all worship, but that He's actually greatly offended by some worship. When our worship becomes more about us than it is about God, he's offended at that, and rightfully so. Puritan author Stephen Charnock perhaps said it best when he wrote this. He said, quote, when we believe that we should be satisfied rather than God glorified in our worship, then we put God below ourselves as though he had been made for us rather than that we had been made for him, end quote. That's a terrifying thought. God is not only offended by worship that's done for our uh, our pleasure, for our sake above all, but he hates it. He's not just offended by it. He hates it. He rejects it because the heart of the worshiper who is primarily concerned with him or, or herself is actually far from God, even if their lips seem to honor him. Psalm 50 is a psalm that shows us God's heart. It shows us how God feels when worship is self-centered, when worship is wrong. And given that you and I, friends, we gather here every week to worship, it's clear that a topic like this should elicit from us a very sober reflection of what's going on within our hearts, what's going on within our minds whenever we worship. This is a psalm of warning. This is a psalm of judgment. For some, this may feel like being woken up by a bucket of of ice-cold water being dumped on you. And I want to encourage you ahead of time that if that's how this feels for you, then praise the Lord. If this is a wake-up call for you, then then praise the Lord. Because, listen, if, if He didn't love you, if He was not concerned about you, if He did not want what is absolutely best for you, and if He was not growing you in Christ's likeness, He would just let you sleep. So, if this is a wake-up call, praise the Lord. If you're woken up by this psalm today, so to speak, I encourage you not to get angry but to repent. Joining with the heart of William Cowper, who once wrote this, the dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. The point of this psalm, of Psalm 50, is simply that God cares how he is worshiped. And thus we must examine our hearts and our worship to see how our worship might actually be superficial and therefore unpleasing to him and to ensure that we are worshiping him as he desires to be worshiped. So may this psalm serve to lead us, every one of us, to worship God in a way that is pleasing and acceptable in his sight. We'll start with verses 1 to 6 in Psalm 50. A psalm of Asaph. The mighty one, God, the Lord, has spoken and summoned the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shone forth. May our God come and not keep silence. Fire devours before him, and it is very tempestuous around him. He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Selah. Now this psalm begins by telling us that 
It was written by Asaph. It was, the, the psalm was written by a man named Asaph. Asaph was a skilled musician and poet or palm, uh, uh, psalm writer. Uh, and, and we find the rest of his psalms in Psalms 73 to 83. But he also wrote this psalm, Psalm 50. Asaph is mentioned by name in 1 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 39. Uh, he was the chief Levitical singer who was charged with leading the singing in... Jerusalem. Uh, we read in First Chronicles chapter 16, verses 1 to 7. Uh, this is what we read. We read, And they brought in the ark of God and placed it inside the tent which David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. When David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. He distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone a loaf of bread and a portion of meat and a raisin cake. He appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord, even to celebrate and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, and second to him, Zechariah, then Jael, then Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Matthiah, Matthiah. <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, Eliab, Benaniah, Obed Edom, and Jael with musical instruments, harps, lyres. Also, Asaph played loud sounding cymbals, and Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, blew trumpets continually before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day, David first assigned Asaph and his relatives to give thanks to the Lord. So Asaph was a godly man who had a very thankful heart, who was charged by David with leading the worship. What that tells us so far is that Asaph was a man who was very concerned not only with worshiping God, but as the chief priest over singing and leading worship, he was very concerned with worshiping God rightly. As a man who led worship, he would have undoubtedly had, uh, had felt a, a very heavy burden for those who were not worshiping God rightly. He would have seen as maybe people came in late or who spent time in song talking with their friends and neighbors instead of directing their hearts and their tongues unto the Lord in song. And thus God chose to use Asaph to deliver this psalm of warning and judgment to the people. The imagery from the outset, by the way, uh, should seem kind of familiar. It should ring a bell a little bit. In the minds of the Jews, it would have almost undoubtedly reminded them of the imagery that we find in the passages when God gave the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, prior to Moses going up the mountain to speak with God, where he received the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, this is what we read in Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 to 19. It says, So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there, was, uh, th that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder." Very, very similar imagery here in the first six verses of Psalm 50. Do you see how, how similar, how many uh, similar, uh, similar images there are here? I mean, here as there, he's presented as a holy God who should instill in us a sense of fear and holy reverence as he's preceded and surrounded by fire and violent, deadly windstorms. As we go through this psalm, we'll see other references to Sinai, by the way, references to the law of God. For example, in verse 7, we see that God says, I am, uh, I am God, your God, which is very similar to how the Ten Commandments begin. Uh, then in verses 18 and 19, for example, we'll see explicit references to the Eighth, Ninth, and Tenth Commandments. Uh, 
But here in this section, verses 1 to 6, we find ourselves summoned to God's holy courtroom. The mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks. In Hebrew, the words there are El, Elohim, and Yahweh. He is the one who presides over this court, and nothing escapes this judge's notice. The plethora of names all heaped together might remind you maybe of the way that an undisputed world champion is introduced in in certain sports like boxing, for example. But Alexander McLaren explains the significance of each name. He writes that, quote, El speaks of God as mighty, Elohim as the object of religious fear, Jehovah as the self-existent and covenant God, end quote. This judge, this God, is the only God who presides over all. He is the God before whom all must stand and before whom all must give an account one day. He's the God who sees all. He's the God who knows all. He's the God who, by virtue of who he is, instructs all from the east and the west to hear him when he speaks. None are exempt from his perfect judgments. All are under his authority, and he owns and is sovereign over all. Now, you might be thinking, wow, this is, this is great. Uh, we're we're going to read about how God is judging the nations uh, and, and crushing them. And what a, what a great and glorious thing it is to think about how God will judge the godless and the wicked. And that's true. And, and that is what we're about to see. But it's probably not the godless and the wicked that you had in mind or that you would be expecting to see his judgments come against. The psalmist says in verses 4 and 5, He summons the heavens above, all the angels and the earth to judge his people. His people. Gather my godly ones to me, he says. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And so as this psalm began and the imagery of of judgment was was starting to play out, you were probably expecting God's judgment against the pagan unregenerate heathens to be the subject here. And that day is coming. The day is coming when the pagan unregenerate heathens will be judged. But that day is not what the psalmist has in focus here. He has God's people in view. God has an elect people, people whom he has from eternity past chosen for himself. And there will be a day when he separates them from all others and gathers them to himself. But what the psalmist is describing here is all who profess to be his people being brought before him. These are people who claim to have faith. In our day and age, we'd say these are people who claim to have been washed in the blood of Jesus, but they have become recipients of, uh, they claim, of the, of the covenant of grace by Christ's perfect sacrifice. That's what people these days would say. But here's what we need to understand, and it's as true in our day as it was back in this day. What we need to understand is that not all who profess Christ possess Christ. Not all who profess Christ possess Christ. It's clear that in the psalmist's day, there were also false professors, those who pretended or who just falsely assumed to be part of God's people. In Jesus' day, many of the Jews felt that they were God's people by virtue of their heritage. And that was probably the case in Asaph's day as well. But let's remember that, as Paul said in Romans 9, they are not all Israel who descended from Israel. Being a physical descendant of Israel means absolutely nothing, which is why Jesus referred to a large gathering of them as children of the devil in John chapter 8. So what does matter? What matters is, is being a spiritual descendant of Israel. That's what Paul was saying when he said they are not all Israel who descended from Israel. He means descended in the flesh. What Asaph is doing here is bringing this reality to the attention of all who claim to be God's people. 
He's about to point out the reality that there are tares among the wheat, so to speak, as Jesus told a parable of in Matthew's gospel. And so it's entirely fitting that Asaph would end verse 6 with the word selah. Selah. Which usually indicates that the hearer or the reader or the singer, since the Psalms were designed as songs, would stop for a moment and consider what has been said as he examines himself in light of what has just been established. Selah basically sums up what the prophet Habakkuk would say in reference to God's judgment upon his people when he wrote in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple, let the earth be silent before him. Now this may come as a surprise to many, but God has promised that judgments begin with those who claim to be his own people. That's why Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, why do I say that this might come as a surprise to many? I say that because there are many in our day and age, many, even in our own time, who claim or who profess Christ, who do not possess Christ. Not everyone who professes Christ possesses Christ, but there are many who claim to be a child of God. But when you examine their lives, you see that really they live no differently than the devil's children. They think the same as the devil's children. They speak the same way as the devil's children. And they act no differently from those who want nothing to do with Jesus. In fact, they may even have such people as their closest friends and companions. There are many who think that they are Christians simply because at some point in their life, they made a profession of faith in Christ. Maybe they said a sinner's prayer. Maybe they were baptized. There are many who think that they're Christian because they go to church every week. There are many who think that they're Christians because they were raised in a Christian household. Their parents are Christians or their parents were Christians. But here's the thing. None of those things makes you a Christian. Not a single one of those things makes you a Christian. None of them. Pagan, unregenerate unbelievers are able to do all of those things. And Scripture attests to that fact. What a sobering reality this is for us to consider. God cares about how he is worshipped. And that's what this court summons is basically what this is. Verses 1 to 6 is a court summons. That's what this court summons is all about. And thus we must examine our hearts and our worship to see how our worship might be superficial and unpleasing to him. And to ensure that we are worshiping him as he desires to be worshipped. We must examine ourselves and make sure that our faith is legitimate. That, that our profession of faith is based on our possession of faith. Now, there are two indictments that God raises against those who profess to be his here in this psalm. First, what we'll look at is we'll see uh, him raise an indictment against those who confuse their ritualism for true righteousness. That's the indictment that we see presented in verses 7 to 15. Let's continue by looking at verses 7 to 15. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices, and your burnt offerings are continually before me. I shall take no bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all it contains. What shall I, sh shall I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of male goats? Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you 
and you will honor me. Friends, when God calls a person to self-examination, when he calls a person to judgment, he needs no corroborating witnesses or testimony. He is the expert witness himself. He is all-knowing. He is all-present. Nothing can add to or subtract from what he already knows. And thus, when he speaks, he always speaks the truth. In this case, God will testify against those who claim to be his, but who would be very wise to examine themselves and the validity of their claim that they are his children. So first he addresses those who confuse their ritualism for true righteousness. Now, just to be clear, there is nothing wrong with ritualism in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with having a routine. There's nothing wrong with ritualism by itself. Uh, For example, if you like praying first thing in the morning in a very ritualistic way, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Or if you like going to church faithfully on the Lord's day in a ritualistic sense, there's not necessarily anything wrong with those things. That's why God, uh, God clarifies what he takes offense at where he, when he says in verse 8, I do not reprove you for your sacrifices and your burnt offerings are continually before me. Those were the rituals that Israel was commanded to participate in. He's not saying that those things in and of themselves are bad or that they are wrong. Uh, Those were things that they uh, were instructed by God to do, and they served a very good purpose. Uh, Whenever a sacrifice was made for sin, blood was spilled. An animal's blood had to be spilled. Blood represented death, and thus they were reminded that the wage of sin is death every time they made a sacrifice. Further, it had a deterring effect. If you think about it, they were to sacrifice animals that had no defects. But, okay, in Western civilization, we really haven't had to think very much uh, about the value of livestock. But listen, if you're just a small farmer and all you've got is three lambs to make you, to, to make, to get you and your family through the year, And you have to present one of those three lambs for sacrifice because you chose to sin. That's going to affect your life in a lot of ways. So sacrifices remind us that that no sin is without consequence. And they remind us uh, that there's a deterring effect, that, that, that sin is costly. But most importantly, the ritual of presenting sacrifices unto God reminded the Jews that God is holy and that you cannot be casual about approaching God. The only way to draw near to Him was by the atonement for sins that was represented in the offerings. So it's not a bad thing. This this is not a bad thing to be reminded that we are sinners who need salvation. In fact, it's a very good thing for us to remember that. And that's what these rituals were supposed to remind the people of. But the book of Hebrews also reminds us that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That's from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. And so with that in mind, we should remember that whatever rituals we do even good things that God has instructed, such as, for example, uh, participating in the Lord's Supper every Sunday, every time we gather. Uh, But we should remember that these things are for our benefit and not for God's benefit. What does God need from us? What can we add to God? Absolutely nothing. God is sufficient and God is complete without us. He he doesn't need a single thing in the world from us. That's why God says, I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your folds, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. In other words, there's nothing that we can give to God that isn't already His. He owns everything. And so when we engage in rituals, we should remember that. God doesn't need that sheep to be slain because he wants a roasted leg of lamb for dinner. There's nothing that we can give to God. 
Nothing. He owns it all already. God doesn't need anything. But the question is, friends, what does God desire from us? And the answer that we see here is a spirit of thanksgiving. Look at verse 14. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Oh boy, what a sacrifice that is. That's not costly, but it can be rare. It apparently was rare in Asaph's day. He wants us to be people who are grateful. That's what pleases him, a thankful heart. And so the primary goal of any ritual that we do, that we participate in, should be just that. Not to just check off a box and to move on to the next item, but to elicit a sense of thankfulness in our hearts toward Him. See, here's the danger of rituals. They can very easily become things that we do because we think that that's what keeps us in good standing with God. Uh, that, That God is pleased by our doing these things, and before you know it, the person's focus is on themselves and what they're doing rather than having our hearts and our minds fixed on God and what He has already done and is already doing. As James Montgomery Boyce notes in his commentary, he says, the real problem with ritual is that they give us feelings of being right with God when actually we may be guilty of the most terrible sins, end quote. See, saying a sinner's prayer or walking up an aisle in church or being baptized or or going to church regularly or praying or reading the Bible, whatever, those things are all things that that we do. And in and of themselves, those things aren't, aren't bad things. They're not necessarily bad in and of themselves. But if those things become the things that we become focused on, if those things in, in our minds become the basis of our assurance of salvation, look out. That is a snare. Let me put it this way. Are you saved because of something that you do, or are you saved because of something that God did? That's a very important question, because one of those options will lead to you being prideful, and one of those options will lead to you being humble and thankful. See, when you, when you realize that you're not saved because of anything about you or anything that you have done, there's only one response that it should elicit. And that is a humble heart, a heart that desires to please God simply because it's overflowing with gratefulness and thanksgiving. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I shall rescue you and you will honor me. See, God isn't honored by ritual that's absent from the heart. In other words, if you're you're keeping your heart far away, but you're just going through the motions, that is not honoring to God. If you're coming to church because, well, this is what you do on Sunday, and oh, the Seahawks game doesn't start until one o'clock anyway. I need something to do in the morning. God's not pleased by that. That doesn't honor God. But when you come because you're thankful for what God has done for you. That's what pleases God. The honor that God deserves goes beyond just lip service. See, see, this is the mistake that the religious leaders made in Jesus' day as well. But what did he say about them? He said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. They thought that they were in good standing with God, but why? Why did they think that they were in good standing with God? Because of what they had done, rather than what God had done. And as a result, even though they they did all these rituals, these rituals weren't softening their hearts. These rituals were actually doing the opposite. They're hardening their hearts. The same sun that melts wax will also harden clay. And so it is today with those who have maybe said a a sinner's prayer, or maybe they've done this, or maybe they've done that. But when you take a closer look 
at their lives. What you see is that their lives are really like a barren tree that produces no good fruit. There is nothing more foolish or heart-hardening than to think that we are saved because of something that we have done or something that we do in a ritualistic way. That's why God ultimately sent prophets to condemn the rituals, uh, the, the ritualistic feasts that the people loved so much. We read this in Amos chapter 5, verses uh, 21 to 23. God says to the people, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps. Now, to, to clarify, again, we need to make sure that we understand this. God is not saying that the festivals are bad. He's not saying that the solemn assemblies are bad or that the burnt offerings or grain offerings or the songs or any of these things are necessarily bad. What he's saying is, get them out of here because you think that you're good with me because of what you're doing externally when your hearts are cold. You're just going through the motions. And that isn't pleasing to God. So why did God feel this way? Because the people confused their ritualism with true righteousness, which made their sacrifices and all the things that they were doing abhorrent to God. Friends, do not mistake your worship unto God as the basis of your salvation. See it as the result of your salvation. See it as uh, the fruit that is, not the root. What a foolishly powerless religion you and I end up with, just like every other religion in the world, when we confuse the fruit and the root, when we confuse ritualism with righteousness, with true righteousness, with the kind of righteousness that is pleasing unto God. God can be pleased by rituals, but what makes the difference is where your heart is. Are you thankful when you come to God? Are you thankful for what he's done or are your eyes on yourself? Those are important questions to consider whenever we examine ourselves. So that's the first indictment. The first indictment is against those who confuse their ritual, ritualism for true righteousness. The second indictment, which we see in verses 16 to 21, is against hypocritical worship, which is just as sobering a reality as the first indictment against godless ritualism. Let's continue with verses 16 to 21. We read this, but to the wicked, God says, what right have you to tell me of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? For you hate dis discipline and you cast my words behind you. When you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you associate with adulterers. You let your mouth loose in evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silence. You thought that I was just like you? I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes." What this is really addressing is a heresy called antinomianism, which is the idea that God doesn't care how we live, that his grace is just going to cover it all. And so his word becomes really just a book full of suggestions, uh, suggestive principles, not a book to be followed. What a warning, by the way, to the plethora of false teachers that are out there. God says, what right have you to tell of my statutes and to take my covenant in your mouth? <sighs> Look out. Uh, this, this is uh, an indictment that's directed toward all who falsely claim to be children of God and who justify their false religion with God's word and yet their lives reveal themselves to be false professors. Their lives tell a different story than their lips do. They are hypocrites. God hates hypocrisy because he's not fooled. 
You know who's fooled? The hypocrite is. The hypocrite's fooled, and, and, and maybe other people will be fooled as well. But the one that matters, God. God's not fooled by hypocrisy. He sees right through it all. He knows what's going on really inside of us when we worship. He sees what we do at all times. He knows our thoughts. He knows our desires. He knows what we're watching. He knows what we're listening to. And he knows what we're worshiping. In Psalm 119, the psalmist writes, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. That's something you'd never hear the natural man say, by the way. It was good for me that I was afflicted. You know, I'm glad that I suffered so that I could learn your statutes. He, he's saying that the, the pain and the discipline that was involved and required to learn obedience to God's word was worth it. It was all worth it. And he's right. And, and we should be able to say the same thing. If I have to be afflicted to learn obedience unto God, if I have to be disciplined to learn obedience unto God, then glory be to God. I'll take that discipline. I'll take whatever trials God sends my way in order to learn to grow in Christ's likeness. But the person that God has in view here in Psalm 50 doesn't say this. He, do, he would never say that it's, it's good that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. He, he hates discipline. He, he, he wants God to be a God who lets him live however he wants to live. So, so, so this is the type of person that kind of partitions their lives. They, they give part of it to God and they keep part of it for themselves. How many of you guys know that you can't do that with your life when it comes to God? You can't give part of it to God and keep the rest for yourself. That's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. So, so what ends up happening is they give God lip service. Maybe they give him an hour on, on the Sabbath, but they keep their hearts far from him because they actually don't delight in God's law. They actually abhor God's law. They abhor God's instructions. They don't desire to walk and to live according to biblical principles and standards. They are much more comfortable and much happier by seeing God's word as a set of opinions and suggestions and options rather than as principles that guide us into holy living. This is the false religion of those who think that they can be a child of God and yet act and live like they still reside in the devil's household. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. They think that they can belong to God and nevertheless sin without consequence, sin without conviction. This is the kind of thinking that Paul attacks in Romans chapter 6, where he writes in verses 1 to 2, he says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Do you see that Paul is saying that it's impossible for somebody who has died to sin to still live to sin? You, you can't have it both ways. Either you died to sin or you lived to sin. And so he goes on to say in verse 11, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. What a terrible and, and terrifying thing it is, or should be, that many people who claim to be Christians are actually alive to sin and dead to God. This is an indictment against antinomianism, against hypocrisy. It's not saying that Christians don't sin. It's not saying that at all. It's saying that we don't feel like we're free to sin because we have grace. Because we do sin, right? And we're going to continue to sin, every one of us. We're going to continue to sin until the day that we stand before Christ and we see him as he is and then we will become like him. But here's the thing. We should, what this is saying is that we should never be comfortable with sin. 
Are you comfortable with sins? Do you have sins that you are completely comfortable with and that you just say, well, I'm glad I'm covered by grace, but I really love doing this or that. We should hate our sin. And we should be going to war with the temptations and the inclinations of the flesh every day. As John Owen famously wrote, he said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. The person in view here in Psalm 50 is a lawless person. The kind of person who lives as if God does not care one bit about how we live or how we act or what we do when nothing, and I mean absolutely nothing, could be more wrong than that. God does care how we act. He does care how we live, and His Word reveals that. That's why it was, that's one reason it was given to us. It shows us how we should live and how we should walk. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm under grace. I'm not under the law. Praise the Lord. No, we're not under the law because the law only has power to condemn. It does not have power to save. And we're not, we're not foolish enough to fall into the snare that think, uh, by, by thinking that if we're just obedient enough that, that we'll be saved. No, we get it. The law reveals that we've fallen. The law reveals that we're sinners. It doesn't have the power to save. It only has the power to condemn. But we would nevertheless also say that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Is it not? It is. And what scriptures did Paul have in mind when he said that to Timothy? He had the Old Testament in mind. That is to say that the law of God does still have a purpose for the child of God in that it teaches us what pleases God. It teaches us God's moral standards. Jesus warned us of the result of the kind of hypocrisy that's being addressed here in Psalm 50 when he taught in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, that many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Who practice what? Lawlessness. That's the issue there. That's what separates those who are true professors from false professors. These people, they did all kinds of great things, miracles, right? But number one, they appeal to their own merit for entry into heaven. And number two, their lives attest to the fact that whatever works they might have done, they were lawless. They didn't care about God's word. They cast it behind them as the psalmist writes about here. What a dangerously foolish thing it is to practice lawlessness, to live our lives as if God doesn't care how we act, as though he never intended us for us to uh, abide by the holy precepts in his word. The hypocrite must be reminded that God does care. The hypocrite must be reminded that God is holy. He says, you thought that I was just like you. That's what God says to the hypocrite. You thought I was just like you. You thought that I was just going to give you a wink and a smile. You thought that I think and value and act just like you. What a false, foolish thing to think about God. Only fallen man wants a God like that. That's a, that's a God who is made in man's image. And only fallen man wants a God who is made in his own image. God is not like us. God is holy, and we must strive to walk in holiness as well. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, when you consider these things, man, this was just such an accusatory psalm. My, my ego is so wounded. I, I thought God was love, but this sounds more like an accusation, and isn't the devil the accuser of the brethren? How can I be accused by God? Here's what I want you to see, friends. When the devil accuses you, he will tell you that you are a terrible sinner and that you don't deserve God, so walk away from him. But when God points out your sin, it's so that you will stop looking to and trusting in yourself 
for salvation and so that you will stop living in a lawless manner and so that you will return to him in faith. And so that's how this psalm ends. Verses 22 and 23, we read this. Now consider this, you who forget God. What a terrible thing. Now consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you in pieces, and there will be none to deliver. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. But to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. Friends, the judgment of God is a real, a real thing. It is a reality. It is really coming. And as such, we must remember who God is and order and live our lives in light of who God is. When we forget, we walk astray. We, we start going through the, the motions on Sunday mornings. We, we, we live lives that look nothing like Christ. But when we remember when we remember that God is holy, we must examine ourselves and we must repent of anything and everything that his word reveals to be unpleasing to him. And when we remember that he has clothed us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, when, when we remember that he has clothed us with the very righteousness of his own son, which is the only true righteousness that is good and pleasing in his sight, then our repentance will be a repentance that does not lead us to death. There is such a thing, but it'll be a repentance that leads us to life in Christ Jesus. It is a fearful and terrible thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. See, both the ritualist and the hypocrite forget who God is. They fail to live in light of who God is. The ritualist forgets that God is all-knowing that, and that he's concerned primarily with our hearts and our minds, more so than he is with our actions and what we do externally. And the hypocrite forgets that God is holy and that he hates sin and that he will judge all sin one day, that he hates hypocrisy. Friends, God cares deeply about how he is worshipped. And thus we must examine our hearts and our worship to see how our worship might be superficial and unpleasing to him and to ensure that we are worshiping him as he desires to be worshiped, as his word instructs. And so may this psalm not break us, but may it heal us. May it serve to not cause us to boast in ourselves, but may it serve to humble us, to remind us of our need to examine ourselves and to repent. And it reminds us of God's willingness to cleanse us of every stain of sin with his grace. And as we remember that, may each of us honor God by living a life of continual worship with a heart filled with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the ways that it instructs us. Lord, it's only by your grace that we are ever able to say with the psalmist that it's good that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Oh Lord, you know the strength of the flesh. You know how great our temptations are. And yet, oh Lord, you have given us an escape from sin every time we are tempted. So teach us, O oh Lord, not to be a people who make excuses. Teach us, O oh Lord, not to be a people who justify sin. Teach us, Lord, to be a people who delight in walking in your way according to your will, regardless of how difficult it may be. Thank you that by your spirit dwelling within us, we're able to turn away from sin and to lead lives that are holy and pleasing unto you. Thank you for the perfect life of Christ, whose perfection is imputed to us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone.
Because we understand, O oh Lord, that we're fallen sinners and without your grace, we couldn't do anything pleasing to you. And so teach us, O oh Lord, to be thankful. To be thankful for the grace that we have. To be thankful for the fact that you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear the glorious truths of your word and that we may abide in them by your grace for the glory of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.